Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her to his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on hyssop, and put it to his mouth. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And bow, bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Amen. The message today, paid in full, is from John 19.30, and um, I'm really going to be just preaching on one phrase there, which is actually one word. You know, in Greek mythology, there's uh, the story of Sisyphus, and Sisyphus was a, a Greek king who was a very mean, uh, cruel king. He would kill people capriciously and, and randomly, and the gods were very displeased with him. So they sentenced Sisyphus to roll a large stone to the top of a mountain. But before he could ever get to the top, it would roll back down. And that's what he was to do perpetually the rest of his life, was to roll a stone up to have it roll back down. I think today there's a lot of modern-day Sisyphus in that they are trying to achieve favor with God to earn salvation or get into heaven by their own efforts. And just when they think they're doing great, they mess up and they have to start over again. I tell you, I meet people like this all the time, all the time, who, who can tell me, especially overseas it seems, like in Africa, even this summer talking to people who said, well, you know, I think I lost my salvation again, so I had to start all over. You know, they think they're doing great, and then they slip. They slip in getting drunk again. They slip in the language they use. They slip in how they treat their wife. They slip in a, a, a adultery or something like that. They lose their salvation. They got to start all over again. And their, their human efforts just seem futile and endless and uh, they just seem, can't seem to get it together. That's why the grace message is so important for them to hear, as we'll see from this passage. Jesus on the cross made seven pronouncements, or made seven statements. We're going to look at the last of them today. If he only made seven statements, they would certainly be important, all of them. The last one would seem to have even more significance. And so as was read a little bit earlier, when Jesus received the sour wine, which was given to him uh, not so much to quench his thirst, because he was thirsty, but it also contained uh, some herbal type of drugs that were supposed to ease his pain. He said, it is finished, and bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. And so that's the end of his earthly life as we knew it up to that point. Now, I said I'm preaching on this phrase, it is finished, but what I'm really doing is preaching on one word. You see, in the English language, it is finished. It's three words. In the Greek language, it's one word. It's the word tetelestai. So we're going to learn a little Greek today, just one word. Tetelestai. Can you say that with me? Tetelestai. And that means, obviously, it is finished. It comes from the Greek verb teleo, which kind of like means to fulfill a purpose or to reach an end. And so Jesus reached the end of his purpose, and he finished what God gave him to do, and he used the word to telestai. It's interesting, but they have discovered old manuscripts and receipts from that period of time that use the word to telestai written across uh, bills of payment to say it was paid in full, and also for tax receipts to say that the taxes were paid in full. We only wish, right? <laughs> we need some to telestai today. But he, at least for that period, it was finished. It was paid in full. And so that's really what the word meant. 
Now, the other thing, a little more technical about the word, it is finished, to telestai, is that it is in the perfect tense in the Greek language. And the perfect tense in the Greek language means that something happened in the past, but the results continue. So when Jesus said it is finished, it means that he's finished what he came to do, but the results of his work, his accomplishment, will continue. It's only used twice in the New Testament, and the other time is in the verse right above it, uh, in verse 28. And it's also used there in the perfect tense. In verse 28, Jesus, knowing that all things had already been finished, to tell us that, to fulfill the scripture said, I thirst. And so that's, then we have verse 29 and then verse 30. So it's only used in the perfect tense two times in the New Testament. Now the question is, when I read this and he says, it is finished, I want to know what does it refer to? And what does finished mean? Was it really finished once and for all. Jesus, the scriptures tell us that he cried out with a loud voice. We don't know if this is what he cried out with a loud voice. It doesn't say what he cried out. But it could be saying that, hey, mission accomplished. But you know, sometimes when we hear that, we don't know exactly what that means. Do you remember in um, May of 2003 in the war with Iraq, uh, President George Bush went on board the USS Abraham Lincoln, I think it was, and had a big sign behind them saying, mission accomplished. And the press ridiculed him for that because actually it wasn't. There was eight more years of war and more people died after he said that than before. So it really wasn't finish, finished. The mission really wasn't yet accomplished. He got a little bit over his skis, we used to say. But, um, but when Jesus says mission accomplished, it is finished. What did he mean? And he says in verse 28, all things were now accomplished. And what are those all things? Well, I think that we find is that a lot of different things converge at the cross in that saying when Jesus said, it is finished. It wasn't just one thing he finished. There was a lot of things he finished. I'm going to give you six of them that I think are pretty clear, and there's, I'm sure there's more. But I'm going to give you six that are, I think are clear and very, very important. So the first one... Um, what does it refer to? What, does, what is finished? Six spiritual accomplishments. Okay? One, it sealed Satan's fate. Jesus' death on the cross fulfilled the promise given back in Genesis 3.15 that a seed from the woman would come and crush the head of the serpent. That would be a death blow. Okay? He would bruise his heel. Satan would bruise Jesus' heel, a temporary wound. But Jesus, the seed, would crush Satan's head. In other words, by his death on the cross, we might say Jesus cut the head off the snake. But the snake is still wiggling, isn't he? We still feel his thrashing about in this world causing a lot of problems, but he's really doomed. And that's what Hebrews 2.14 tells us, uh, that Jesus came that, uh, and through his death might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil. And that's why you and I and all believers don't fear death anymore because Satan can't hold that power over us. Jesus destroyed it. My daughter in the hospital knew things were not good with her, and, but she said, I'm not afraid to die. She has a strong faith. And that's what you can say when Jesus, we know that Jesus has destroyed Satan and his power that he holds over us, the power of death. And 1 John 3, 8 for this purpose, the Son of God has manifest, was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. All the evil, the chaos uh, that has been caused by Satan in this world, disrupted families, societies, countries, dictatorships, uh, terrible, terrible tragedies. God going to, has, has destroyed the works of the devil once and for all, and he will bring in a better world. So he has sealed Satan's fate. That's one of the things I think the scriptures point to that happened at the cross when Jesus said to Telestai. Another thing I think that happened was he fulfilled Old Testament prophecies about a final sacrifice for sin. You have many Old Testament sac promises about a, a sin bearer who would come. You have the pictures in the Old Testament of the sacrifices, the Day of Atonement, the Passover feast, and all these point to the death of something for sin. And Isaiah 53 is perhaps the most 
clear passage that I didn't write it all out for you. But, you know, we all like sheep have gone astray. We each turned our own way, but God has laid on him the iniquity of us all. God laid on him the suffering servant, the sin bearer, the iniquity or sins of us all. Daniel talked about Messiah the prince will finish the transgression to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity. To finish the transgression. John 1 29, John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Hebrews 9 26, the first part says that Jesus appeared to put away sin. How? By the sacrifice of himself. I think we have to conclude that when Jesus said it is finished, he's saying, I'm the final sacrifice. I'm fulfilling all the prophecies from Genesis to Malachi that predicted my coming and his death and his resurrection. He's putting away sin once and for all. A third thing I think that was done at the cross when Jesus said to Telestai is he fulfilled the requirements of the Mosaic law. Now the Jewish people lived under the old covenant, the old Mosaic law for a couple thousand years, was it? A couple thousand years? And, but they could never fulfill it. And even today, many people have the misunderstanding that the law was given as a way to save people, but it was never given as a way to save people. It was given as a way to show that we needed to be saved. It was given to show the Jews a way of life and how they could worship God, but not to save them once and for all. As Jesus said in Matthew 5, 17, do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. So Jesus saw the value of the law, but Galatians chapter 3, verse 24 tells us that the law was given to lead us to Christ. The law put us under a curse, put the Jews under a curse, and anybody who tries to follow it under a curse. But the point of that, the law, and pointing out all the commandments and the, of God's righteousness was to show us that we could never do it. And if we can never do it, then we have to have somebody that does it for us, and so it leads us to a Savior who can fulfill the law for us. And that's what Jesus did. In Luke 24, 44, Jesus said, All things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. So he's, he was there on the road to Emmaus explaining that he fulfilled everything that the law and prophets and the Psalms predicted about him, the coming Messiah. Galatians 3, 13, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Redemption speaks of a price that was paid. And so he redeemed us from the curse of the law. He paid the price that the law demanded. Breaking the law demands a price. It demands, in God's justice, it demands a payment. And the only payment that would, would satisfy God's wrath towards us is, the pay, uh, is a death. It was signified by the death of a lamb or a sacrifice in the old days, but th that was to show that there needed to be an eternal sacrifice someday, uh, a death of someone who had eternal significance the, God, the man, the God, Jesus Christ, who is both man and God. And so he became a curse for us. You see, the law was intended to curse us. I think I heard recently that Louisiana just made a law that the Ten Commandments would be hung in every classroom, public classroom. And a lot of us grew up that way. I, I don't know if I think that's a good idea or not. It's a good idea in the sense that it shows us God's righteousness, but it's bad in the sense if people think that they have to do that, keep the Ten Commandments to go to heaven, because all that does is frustrate people and show them that they can't keep all that the law says. It tells us what we should do. It also tells us what we don't do. Anyway, I hope the teachers explain that to them. I don't think that they will. But. And the fourth thing I think that comes upon uh, comes out of that saying to tell us die from Jesus as he satisfied God's wrath towards sinners. Matthew 20, 28, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom or payment for many. As I said, God's justice demanded a payment. Jesus made that payment. Here he gave his life a ransom for many. He didn't give the ransom to Satan, as some people might teach. He gave it as a payment to God 
to satisfy God's justice. Romans 3, 25, when, whom God set forth, speaking of Jesus, God set forth as a propitiation by his blood. The word propitiation essentially means to a covering or, or an appeasement. God's justice was appeased by the blood or the death of Jesus Christ. He was the atoning sacrifice. 1 John 2, 2, he himself is the propitiation, there's that word again, for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. So Jesus was able to make a payment for the whole world because he was God in the flesh and his sacrifice was eternal and was eternally uh, sufficient, totally sufficient for the whole world. His atonement was a satisfactory payment for all sin. Now the word propitiation, a big word for us, is just an atoning sacrifice that pays sin's penalties for all people that satisfies God's justice. I like to say it, it covers our sins. We're covered by what Jesus did on the cross. Fifth thing I see in that phrase, to tell aside, another thing he accomplished is the purpose for which God sent him. Now that seems a little bit general, but Jesus himself said in John 4, 34, Jesus said to his apostles then, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. He didn't really explain what that work was, but, but shortly after that he tells the disciples, look at the fields, they're ripe to harvest and go and labor in the field and reap a harvest for eternal life. And so part of his work was then to provide the basis uh, of the gospel message that his disciples could go and preach to the fields that were ripe, the people who were ready to hear that message and wanted, needed to hear that message so that they could reap a harvest of souls. John 17, 4, Jesus said, I, he's praying to God, I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished, from the same word, to teleo, finished the work that you gave, you have given me to do. So Jesus is telling God, I've finished the work you've given me to do. That's one of the questions that's raised when we hear Jesus saying on the cross, it is finished. Who's he saying that to? The people that were there certainly heard him. His apostles, his disciples heard him. But the unsaved people heard him, or was he saying it to God? God heard him. Or did he just intend it for everyone? Mission accomplished. Whoever you are, I want you to know I've done what I came to do, what God sent me to do. I'm comfortable with him saying that to everybody. Certainly through the scriptures, everybody knows it now. In Colossians 1, 21 through 22, another thing Jesus finished and you who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. So, speaking of the human race who was separated from God and alienated from God because of our sin, he has now reconciled or restored in harmony a relationship between man and God. Jesus made that harmony possible. And that's what the word reconciliation signifies. Um, and he did that, it says, through his death. And then the sixth and final one I'll give you is he initiated the new covenant. And here he mentions his death as well. Like in Matthew 26, 28, when he's observing the Lord's Supper in the upper room, he says, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for the remission of sins. So blood always signifies his death, and he was speaking of his death, which was to come very shortly, and that blood would signify the initiation of the new covenant. The new covenant, which was predicted in the Old Testament, if you look at the note in the bottom, the new covenant was ultimately fulfilled by the nation of Israel in the future. But I believe that there are some spiritual blessings that, that Jesus uh, allowed to be possible for those who believe today, like the forgiveness of sins, a deeper knowledge of God, um, a, a new heart, things that he promised in the new covenant in Jeremiah 31, 33, and Ezekiel 36 through 37, ex expounded upon in Hebrews chapter 9. So look at Hebrews 9, 15. For this reason, he, Jesus, is the mediator of the new covenant. How? By means of death. For the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant, the Mosaic covenant, that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. Hebrews is pointing out that for a covenant to be made, there needed to be a death. 
there needed to be the death of, uh, that's why Jesus' death is significant. He mediated the new covenant through his death. And many times in those days, in the ancient days, covenants were sealed by the death of an animal or something to show the seriousness of it. Well, what could be more serious than Jesus and his own life sealing the new covenant for, for the, us today to participate in, but the Jews ultimately to f be fulfilled with them in the future? Colossians 2, verse 13 through 14, has kind of a finality to it, even though the word finish is not used here. And you being dead in trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us. It's as if God just took that bill of debt that our sins created and just wiped it out, deleted it. I'm sure Paul would have used that word if he had been computerized. Deleted it, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it, where? To the cross, where Jesus died. There when he died was symbolically a list of our sins and a list of our names, and all of that was put to death with him so that we could enjoy forgiveness of all our trespasses today. There's a finality to the statement of Colossians 2 through 14 that shows us what Jesus did. Well, if, that's, if those six things Jesus did, then what's left to do? Satan has no claim to us. Sin has no power over us. The law has no rule over us. God's not angry with us anymore. Jesus finished God's work for us. And the new covenant blessings are now available to us. So, what is left for us to do? And the answer to that is nothing. Nothing. To tell us die. It is finished. Jesus did everything we could not do. He lived the life we could not live. He was tempted in the wilderness, but unlike Adam who gave in to temptation, Jesus withstood the temptations. Unlike Adam who sinned, Jesus never sinned. Unlike Adam who was imperfect, Jesus lived a perfect life. And then as the Son of God, he died a perfect death, something we could never do. We could only die for one person, ourselves. Jesus died for every person who would be born into this world. What's left for us to do? Absolutely nothing. And so then, isn't it a bit audacious or even arrogant for us to think that we can add to what Jesus already has done? And for us to say, well, it's not really finished. Let me help you, God. Let me finish what Jesus didn't finish. Let me finish with my good works. And so I'll go to church every Sunday. I'll read the Bible every Sunday. I'll, I'll try to shape my conduct and not sin. And we'll measure the things that I do and don't do. And hopefully it adds up and I can finish because Jesus didn't do, it, do enough for me. You know, most of the world lives under that pressure. And to prove that, I give a survey out when I train these pastors and people. If it's a cold audience that I've never trained before. It's just, I call it the gospel survey. It's on my website. It's 11 things, how do you get to heaven, how do you become a Christian, how do you get saved? I list 11 things, and only one of them is right. Believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior from sin. But I list a lot of other things. Be baptized, uh, keep the Ten Commandments, go to church, love one another. I list all these other things. Most people will check believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior, but they'll also check about five or six or all of them. Which tells me that they're not thinking that Jesus has done enough. And testimony after testimony, will, will, pastors will tell me, you know, I don't know that I didn't know I was going to heaven. I would tell my congregation, I don't know if they're going to heaven. And that's why we come in there and explain what the gospel of grace is, that Jesus paid it all. It's finished. There's nothing left for you to do. It's all been done. And so it's a bit arrogant to think that we can improve on what God has done, isn't it? It's kind of like... Um, if I were to go into the Louvre in Paris and see the Mona Lisa and say, you know, if I had a paintbrush, I could, I could make it a little bit better. That'd be arrogant. Or if uh, 
if I see a hummingbird hovering over a flower like I do in my backyard and say, you know, God, no, I don't know. I think I could do a little bit better with that little hummingbird there. There are some things that God has done and that are done in this world that are just perfect and cannot be improved upon. And it's arrogant and insulting to think that we can. And so how must God feel if we tell him, God, you didn't do enough for me. I can improve on it. Let me do something and let me show you how I can be worthy of your salvation. But the very word grace means that we're unworthy and he gives us a free gift that we don't deserve. So we can confidently receive and offer people's God's gift of eternal life and the forgiveness of sins because we are confident that Jesus did it all. He said, it is finished to tell us die. And you've probably heard me say this before, but there's only two religions in the world. Two religions in the world. One religion says do. And that's pretty much where most of the world lives. The Muslims, the Hindus, the, the, uh, the Jews, they're all following their own list of rules and things and rituals that they have to do. Pilgrimages, fasts, all these things they must do to find favor with their deity and to reach the goal of eternal life, nirvana, or whatever it is to them. Every religion has a list of do, things they must do. Even in Protestant Christianity, we find many, many people who think they still have to do things to earn God's favor. On the other hand, the other, there's only one other religion, and that's called the religion of done. And that's biblical Christianity. That's where Jesus said to tell us die. It's, it's finished. There's nothing left for you to do except for to receive what I've done. That's called grace. That's called a free gift. And how do we receive the free gift? We receive it through faith, believing, being convinced that it's absolutely true, that his promise of eternal life is true for me. I don't have to do anything. I can't do anything to earn it, deserve it, prove it, or keep it. It's all been done. And that's a wonderful, fantastic truth for us. Biblical Christianity says that Jesus did everything we could not do. Just accept what he has done on our behalf. And so when God looks at us, he doesn't look at our works. He looks at Christ's righteousness that we have received through faith. And that's called salvation by grace through faith. Paid in full. Yes, amen, and thank you, God, for doing that for us. Well, let me have a word of prayer with you. And I want to pray so that uh, everyone who hears my voice, no matter when or where or how you're listening, would understand that what Jesus did on the cross had eternal significance. He paid an eternal price for our sins that we could never pay for. And he offers us now a free gift that has been bought and purchased by him. We can be redeemed through the death of Jesus Christ. And the gift is there, ready to be received through faith by those who will simply say to God, Lord, I'm a sinner, and I want to receive the gift of eternal life. I cannot do anything to earn it or deserve it. I don't deserve it, and thank you. I trust you for it, and I thank you for the gift of eternal life. And if that's your prayer, then you can know for certain that Jesus' work is effective for you, and you will see God and live with him forever. And so, Father, we are grateful that you did everything we could never do. And we thank you for that. We thank you for the grace that is in our Lord Jesus Christ, the wonderful grace of Jesus. I pray in his name. Amen.